Hi, welcome back to the channel. I am Martin Bell. I'm a data scientist with 10 years of experience. I teach about data science and programming. If you're into this kind of topic, please consider subscribing. In today's video, I'll be covering the top 10 tips and tricks of Pandas. I think are very useful for your day-to-day -day work. So yeah, let's get started. Here I have the 10 tips and tricks that we'll be covering. So we'll be starting importing some libraries. So just run shift enter. Um, so all the code will be available in GitHub later. So you don't have to copy paste it. You can access the notebook later on. So here I, I load up some data sets from the Seaborn library, and I'll be using them throughout the, the, this notebook. The first one, convert all columns to lowercase and remove white space. Uh, I generally do this when I start working with data because it allows me to use the dot syntax. So uh, here I'm creating a, some sort of dummy uh, data frame. So we can see that, yeah, the column has this white space there. We have this bar here. And generally, I just would consider this as not clean. And one way to, to approach it is to fix this column name. One thing that we can do in Pandas is just run a function to clean all the columns. Here I define such function. I first import the regular expressions module. And here I'm explaining what I'm doing in each step. But basically, you pass in a string. And you first convert it to string, just in case. Um, then we replace this bar with white space. I mean, this you could need it or not need it, depending on your use case. Uh, so this is the first. Uh, pre-processing step. So let's unpack what's going on here. So I, I use this function dot read dot sub. So I first let yeah just try to find this pattern, this bar, and I replace it with a space. So then um, let's say if there were multiple bars there, um, backslashes, um, you would replace you would get multiple white spaces. So here I'm I'm handling that issue. So if you have multiple white spaces, replace it to one white space. And then I'm, each white space, I replace it by an underscore. So yeah, and at the end, I, I convert it to lowercase. So if I run this, um, we can test the function, right? So, so let's try with user ID. So it, it converts it to something a lot cleaner. In my opinion, this is a lot cleaner. Product description. Um, the same. So we have this bar, it replaces with an underscore. Um, I mean, you could write this function in many ways. Generally, depending on the data, I just write a function that I, what I need for that situation. So there won't be one that will work for all cases. So how do you replace it to re replace all the columns? So um, here I use a, a list comprehension. So I, I'm looking through all the columns in the data frame, and I apply this function. So, and that's how the clean data looks. User ID, product description, price, I, I do nothing. So now what we can do is just dot user ID. And this allows me to use the dot syntax that I find a lot better than this syntax. Okay, so let's continue with the next one. So here, I select columns by D type. So, how does this work? So let's check the details of the diamond data set. And what I can do is select the, the columns that have D type category and int. So basically, it will be these columns and the price column. So, and I mean, this is a nice trick. Sometimes it works, sometimes it's useful, it depends on how the data types are set up. But if you do the work of setting this correctly, then this is very convenient. The next tip and trick is group by multiple columns and avoiding the multi-index output. So how can we do this? Here I'm working with the diamonds data set also. So I define a list of columns. Um, so I have the, the data frame. I select the columns that I want to keep. And then I call group by. So I group by these three columns that are categorical. So cut color clarity, and I pass in as index equals false. So this is what about avoids the multi-index output. So I just get a data frame. Um, I personally prefer this 
because yeah if you need to make a plot or you need to use like Seaborn or Plotline or Plotly you don't need the multi-index so select the top and rows what I'm doing here is basically uh, grabbing this data frame that we created here so we did a, a group by and we have the average for cut color clarity so what I'm what I'm filtering here is the top five uh, values of the price in this data frame and I could I could do the same thing with the, the smallest ones um, but yeah this is a kind of convenience function so you could sort the data frame and keep the first uh, rows but sometimes this is okay uh, I think this is one of my favorites that I, I rarely see people using. So for this, we're going to download some data that's really not in the best format for data analysis. Um, I mean, you, you could get this situation relatively often. So it's kind of like a format people might use in Excel, just put one year as a column. Um, so basically this is how the data looks like. So and we have a bunch of kind of ID variables here. So country, country name. So these are the same thing, but two different columns. Series code. So it's probably what the data is about, scale and decimals. So basically what we need to do with the, this data set is convert it from wide to long format. So now it's in what we call the wide format. So we need to put the years uh, as rows. So let's see how we can do that. So. These are all the columns that we have. So what we just took a look at the data and we can first clean the columns uh, using the function we defined before. Um, I mean, it, already this is a lot, uh, it looks a lot better. Um, and these are the, the arguments of the function we'll be using, melt. I'll probably show you first what melt does and then we can get back to the argument. So what, what it did, it, it converted the the columns it converted to rows. So now we have one observation per row. And that's what we generally call tidy data. One more thing you can do is just explicitly um, define the value variables. So, I mean, if I do this, it just works. So basically, all I need to define is the, the columns that I want to keep as IDs, quote unquote, that are fixed. And it kind of figures out the, the the column that I want to reshape. But you can also pass in here. So here I'm passing the, the years, right? From 1990 to 2011. And it converts it to, it does the same thing. So, but this is, I mean, maybe it's kind of safer. And if you have other columns in the data, it will know how to handle the results. Finally, if you want to have a different value here, so maybe we just want to call this a year. So, um, you can just define a bar name here and the value name, I think value is fine because you still have, yeah, a value for these series. And, and that's what Mel does. So basically it's a very useful tool to go from these type of data sets that are very, I don't think this is useful for data analysis and you go to a long format that's a lot easier to make plots or, okay. So let's continue with the tips. This is, um, yeah, kind of a high level tip. Basically, in order to avoid bugs, what you have to do is go to kernel and restart and run all. What this does is it restarts the Python process and it runs all the cells in the order uh, you wrote them. So sometimes you're like trying things out, you go up and down and run something up and run something down and you miss the order of execution. So if you every now and then you restart the novel and run it again and run everything, you make sure that you don't have any bugs in, at least in the order of execution. And you'll be surprised how often you find issues. Another tip, avoiding, avoid looping over a data frame. This is something, um, that's generally said, I mean, kind of everybody that's not, uh, starting out knows this, but I mean, I think you can, you can do it if you're working with very small data sets, maybe for trying the code or testing some ideas, but I want to show you how much you lose in terms of performance. Um, so here we have the Diamonds data sets has 53,000 rows. 
if I do a for loop, I mean, this is actually the syntax you would loop through each row. Um, generally, the way you do it is with either tuples. And you can access each column right here. I'm accessing X, Y, and Z. I'm just multiplying them. This doesn't make a lot of sense, but just wanted to make an example. Here I'm um, accumulating the results of this multiplication in a list. So this takes 49 milliseconds. And what happens if I use apply? Okay, yeah, not great. And what happens if you do it the right way? That's literally multiplying the columns. You'll see that this takes like less than a millisecond. It just can't be compared. 49 milliseconds for just doing a multiplication. Okay, and another way to do it is using assign, which I mean has a kind of a little bit more verbose syntax. I wouldn't use assign for this kind of problem. I would just go with this approach. I see some people are starting to use assign. The only situation where assign makes sense is where you have a lot of data pre-processing steps and you want to do them all together. But I don't know. I, I think it it might not make the code be very easy to read. It, it doesn't make it very easy to read. It, it's a little bit more cryptic. I guess as we get used to it, to the syntax, maybe, yeah, it's fine. Uh, this takes a reasonable amount of time, so two milliseconds, but still, this one is the fastest one. Basically, this is all I can say about looping over a data frame. There's another way to loop through a data frame using either rows, but just don't do that because uh, yeah, there are a lot of problems with that. If you have to loop through a uh, data frame, use either tuples. I'm guilty of having used this looping. Uh, I mean, it, it's if it, if you have like I don't know ten thousand rows and you need to do some uh, yeah something that's kind of complex and you don't want to you know, do it in this way. Maybe it's too yeah the syntax looks awful. Maybe it makes sense, but if you have a little bit more data, you'll be waiting a lot of time. Let's continue. Uh, eighth tip. Use MPWare to flag outliers. So here's a um, kind of nice use case of MPWare. I have these taxis uh, data set, basically the distance of taxi rights. This is more or less the distribution, how it looks. And the idea is to use MPWare to flag outliers. So here I define the median. Um, then I define the median absolute devi deviation. So there are multiple ways you can do this, but I wanted to use the median because it's uh, robust, so it's not affected by outliers. In this case, it doesn't matter that much, but in other cases, I think this is a, a good way uh, to handle outliers. So the way I'm defining an outlier is if it's kind of in the in this area. So that so one way to do it without doing it manually is using these two uh, statistics. So the first one is the median. And then I'm multiplying three times this uh, median absolute deviation, this math. So what this gives me is uh, 7.8. So whatever that's higher uh, than 7.8 is an outlier. So, and this is how I, I define it with MPWare. So MPWare, so taxis distance larger than this limit, outlier, then it's okay. So this is the value count. Of course, most observations are okay, but you have a few potential outliers. I mean, I mean, just take this with a grain of salt. It was mostly to show an example, a little bit more interesting of MPWare. Um, but, but yeah, this is one, one approach you could take. The next one is using PD cut to discretize variables. How can you do some discretization? So let's use the taxis data set. So here we have the fair histogram. So it looks very skewed also. Um, so you can do the decils and you can see that there are some values that are very high. So maybe what we would like to do is convert this distribution into, I don't know, like three groups, um, something more human comprehensible. And so this is one way you can do it with cut. So you pass in the numeric variable, you define a set of uh, breaks of the data that you're breaking the data up in these uh, values. So from zero to 10, to 10 to 30, 30 to infinity. And then you pass in labels of these groups. So 
0 to 10, um, 10 to 30 is medium, and 30 to infinity is high. And so right, what it does, it changes the bracket. So let me show you in a second what that means. So if I comment this out, you'll see how this is computed. So it's, it does 0 to 10. Um, so we have 3,400 observations, 10 to 30, and 30 to infinity. So if you comment this out, um, um, okay, maybe we can do it true here. Um, so what changes is how these brackets are computed. So that's the only, I mean, I, I find this false argument is easier to understand from, so because it's inclusive here. And, and so, yeah, it, it just is easier for me, but I, it's personal preference. So another one that I, I don't see at all being used is Q cut. And what this does is it, it converts um, the values into, uh, yeah, a given amount of groups of equal size, but it keeps the sorting of data. So it, I mean, it would be uh, assigning all the rows to, for example, one decile or one quartile. So decils is if we split the data in 10 groups and we put uh, the same amount of rows in each uh, bucket, so that would be a decile. So the quartile is the same, but four with four groups. So there's a, um, yeah, I mean, there's a kind of trick that you need to know to make this work. So the only thing you need to do is first rank the numeric variable, but the rest is, I think, very straightforward. So here, what you're doing is you pass PD Q cut, you pass in the numeric variable, you say, okay, split it in 10 groups. So this would be decils. And um, yeah, and that, that's it. These are some, some other arguments you need to pass. So here I'm, I'm computing the decils of the fair variable and the tip. So basically the, the amount that's paid uh, at each, um, yeah, at each uh, trip. So here are the numeric values. And okay, so one thing you can do once you compute these uh, decils is do some aggregations on the decils. So here, what I'm doing is I'm using uh, both of these decils. So I have the decils of fair, I have the tip decils, and here I could have any other numeric variables. So in this case, I'm using fair that, uh, yeah, but you could pass in distance here, for example. And basically what this shows is for the, the ranks of, for the, the decils of fair and the decils of tip. Um, this is the kind of relationship that you have uh, for the distance. So of course, the, the larger the distance, the more expensive the fair will be. But I mean, for the, the tip, it, it doesn't seem to be that way, uh, at least uh, not in the shortest trips. Uh, the tip kind of starts to grow uh, as we get here. And I think this is a very interesting type of analysis. Um, you have, you basically are discretizing two numeric variables and they give you uh, some sort of ranking that's relatively easy to interpret. That covers all the tips and tricks. I hope you enjoy the video. Uh, please subscribe and like it if you enjoyed it. Thank you very much.